You just tuned into the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Now, before I go into the giveaway for today's podcast, and it's a good one, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, uh, turn on your notifications, share this with your friends. Okay, if you comment in the first 24 hours and we pick your comment, so we drop the episode in that 24 hours, leave a comment, make it good. If we pick it and it's the, one of the first ones in the first 24 hours, look what you're going to get. One box of Magic Spoon cereal for free, two boxes of Magic Spoon cereal for free. You actually get both of these sent to you for free. Cocoa flavor, frosted flavor. Here's why it's awesome. They're high protein, no sugar cereals. The protein content is really good. It's way protein. And these are gluten-free too. So these are also gluten-free. They're amazing. They taste good. And we'll send them to your house. Just leave a comment in the first 24 hours and make it a good one so Doug will pick it. Okay. Uh, oh, one more thing before we start this amazing podcast. Uh, we are running the phase two bundle. Phase two bundle includes two of our most popular MAPS workout programs. The first one is MAPS performance. This one is athletic minded. And then we have MAPS aesthetic, which is bodybuilder minded. Both programs by themselves about three months long. So if you combine the two, you get a phenomenal six months of ex expert exercise program. Great workouts. You look amazing and you move amazing. Normally, both programs together will cost you almost 300 bucks, but right now you get the phase two bundle at $79.99. Go check them out. Go to mapsfebruary.com. All right, enjoy the show. How amazing are are the the deadlift videos that are getting posted right now? I'm oh, so, yeah. I'm so, so great. I'm so impressed. What's the hashtag? I love to watch it, man. Strong Strong Women Deadlift. Okay. Some of these some of these ladies are pulling Bro, there's ladies. some serious weight. Did you see that? there's yeah. a chick pulling pulling four hundred pounds? Four hundred pounds, dude. Yeah. Oh my god. No, yeah. it's that's impressive. It's really, really cool to see. You know, I mean we talked about this. You know, Chokey and I talked about this almost a month ago about doing something for uh, Woman's Day, which is March 1st, right? So mm -hmm. National Woman's Day is March 1st, and we wanted to come up with something really cool, like some sort of a cool giveaway just for women. Mm -hmm. And we talk so much about the benefits of squatting and deadlifting and that, you know, more and more, more and more now we see more women doing it than before. I mean, yes. I mean we saw nobody doing it just 15 years ago, and then men started doing it in the in the commercial gyms and now you're starting to see more and more women and I'm just blown away by the response. Yeah. I, you know, I anticipated us to get, you know, a, a little bit of people that were like, "Oh yeah, I love the deadlift and here's videos." But boy, it's Oh, like, hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah, they're flooding in right now and so I'm super super pumped. It's I don't know, you know, how much I don't know how many people who are listening have been in gyms as long as we have, but it's this is one of the most amazing swings. Yeah. yeah. That uh, I can think of in fitness. It's okay. This is no joke. When I first started working in gyms, even five years into my career, if I deadlifted, a man, a trainer deadlifted, inevitably a member would yeah. come up to me and tell me that I don't, what are you're you doing? You're hurt yourself. That's not how, you're not supposed to do or that. Or tell the manager. Tell the manager. Nobody deadlifted, not men, yeah. not women. There was in, in these gyms, you know, some of these gyms I managed were, you know, 30, 40,000 square foot. Facility, so they're big box oh, gyms. Two thousand workouts a day. Yeah, and there was one. Not, I mean, this is not an exaggeration. There'd be one squat rack in the whole place, yeah. mm -hmm. and it would be dusty. No. Nobody would do anything in there except for the occasional person doing barbell curls. Yeah, you know, in the squat rack because the <laughs> the other whatever stations were were taken up. Oh, yeah. Nobody did these things. Then little by little, you started seeing you know guys do it. Um, women never. They wouldn't even touch them. And I remember when I would train clients. And I would have them do some of these lifts. It was a process of convincing them why they need to do it, why this is so beneficial. Luckily, I can be pretty convincing. I know you guys are as well. But it only took about a month of doing them before I had to stop. I didn't have to convince them anymore. Yeah. They would start doing it, and they'd be like, my butt. Oh, my God, my back. Everything looks amazing. I feel so yeah. good. Why I, I'm eating more calories and burning more body fat. What's going on? I'm like, you're doing the most effective exercises. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, it's really cool to see. It's super, super cool. Um, I love seeing it. And, you know, of course, kudos to – I think CrossFit had a, played a role in that uh, as well because when they came on the scene, they had a bunch of, you know, fit, great-looking women doing these lifts. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of broke the stereotype. A little bit. Well, that's so it's great to see now. That yeah, opened e the doors for sure. That's what's even more exciting than I felt like watching these videos. I mean, there's obviously there's a there's you know a handful of of women that are competing that are powerlifting. You can even see some of these girls are training in probably a CrossFit type of gym. Mm -hmm. But then there's just a lot of just 
normal ass clients that are mm-hmm. deadlifting and it's freaking awesome to see that's that's to me yeah, a, and you don't have to be a power lifter it's right. just a, a really you know important foundational lift that gets you strong overall and then you build upon that and you can sculpt and you can do whatever with your body in terms of training but it's such one of those crucial lifts that i love to see you know people come back to Dude, when i when when doug hired me years ago when we first met he hired me because he had back problems and i remember when i had him deadlift for the first time the look on his face was like i have back stuff you sure i'm like yes don't worry Mm -hmm. this will make your butt your back bulletproof today doug's back is pretty much bulletproof the guy never hurts but when he came to me he had back problems among other things deadlifting was part of getting his back to get so of course i I progressed him properly and we did everything appropriately Mm -hmm. but he got to the point where he was you know pulling more than twice his body weight um and back never had a problem at all yeah just one of those things so it is really really cool to see and i also you know what you're seeing too a lot now adam is in the uh the female um bikini competition world which you know they're they're trying they're not really trying to get super buffed or whatever a lot of them the off season now are uh powerlifting yeah because they're seeing the gains that they're getting, yeah. and especially their butt and hamstrings, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, from some of the. I've lifts. watched that change just oh, yeah. in the, just in the last five to six years. That's changed a lot. When mm-hmm. I first came on the scene and I was getting ready to compete, um, even both guys and girls, you didn't see deadlifting. Deadlifting mm-hmm. was a thing that supposedly made your waist bigger, so everybody <laughs> avoided it. I remember like feeling so like here I am like in the gym that we were at. There were so many competitors. There's a lot. There's probably at all times that I was lifting in there at least three to five other amateurs and pros in the men's category and probably at least seven to ten bikini girls that would always be in the gym. So we'd always be around each other, and I'd be the guy by myself over there squatting and deadlifting, everybody looking at me all crazy why I wasn't wearing a squeam and not concerned about <laughs> my waist blowing a up. A squeam. I, yeah. Dude, I still can't believe that. That's, That's like that caught on with dudes. You it's know? still a thing, man. Oh, it's dude. still – and you know you what? You guys know it's funny because I, I – I, at one point I thought it would be a funny thing to create other accounts and like false accounts. Oh, yeah, stuff. I remember that. Dude, I, I, I ran across this. Like it was suggested to me. I'm like it was my own creation. It was, I called it like hourglass dudes. And I, took, <laughs> I just took all the pictures on the internet I could find with these guys, like wearing those, those, uh, waist trainers and, and trying to, you know, like justify model it. with them and yeah. justify it. I'm yeah. just like, this needs to be on, on front street. They're like, you know, how can we make, you know, uh, bodybuilding and physique, something that people can make fun of even more? Oh, I know. <laughs> well, let's wear a corset and make our muscles know, atrophy right? That's just- around our waist. Do you, re- do you remember Adam when you, cause I know I'm pretty sure Justin learned the lifts, like the big compound lifts, because he was in football. In which case, luckily, football, uh, they never, you know, there was, it was always in to squat and do those yeah. lifts because they were so functional. Yeah, just not deadlifting, but yeah. Yeah, you, well, you guys did cleans. Yeah, we did. A cleans, lot of pounds. Yeah, so which, you're still getting that hip Still pinch. getting it. Yeah. Now, Adam, do you remember when you first really got introduced to like deadlifts and, and barbell squats when you first were like, huh, this so, might be something? Well, okay, so barbell squats, I was I was introduced to early, um, but still avoided them like the plague. So I was like, I was probably two years into my training career as a trainer, and I had, a, a, I was lifting with these old school, like, you know, old school bodybuilder, power lifter type guys, like just gym rats. They were good 15 years older. Than How I old was. were you? 22 oh, okay you know and I remember and I've told this story before where he'd st- he'd stack like three plates you know I mean and at that time I could barely squat like 135 mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like yeah, I want you to feel the weight <laughs> so like, you just hold it yeah he just had me hold it or they would spot me all the way down and back up but he would be totally carrying me the mm-hmm. whole way but he wanted me to feel the weight mm-hmm. and anytime that I would do it on my own it would just my back would flare up so bad and I knew that they were good for me and I was being told that I needed to do it but I would, I would, honestly, I rarely ever squatted. I was a leg press and lunge and machine. You just didn't guy. know how to really work on mobility and the issues. Yeah, why. I just, you know, what I at, at that early years of my tra- training career, um, I just, you know, th- it bothered me, and that's why I didn't really train it with my clients. I was like, well, man, I'm a fitness trainer, and it bothers my back, so I, I would fall for the excuse for my clients. My mm-hmm. clients would say, oh, I have a bad back. Okay, so we didn't squat. Yeah, because you're like me too. Yeah, me too. That's how I felt about it, and I never deadlifted. Deadlifting, and I think it was a certification, and I don't remember what cert I was going through, reading the benefits of it and the programming of deadlifting, and then I began to start to to do it. But even then, I back then I was I was such a form and technique guy that I would never like push the weight. Mm-hmm. I never deadlifted less than like uh, ten reps. I was doing I was a ten rep guy in deadlifts, real lightweight, one thirty five. Mm-hmm. Maybe I pushed two twenty five. It wasn't until you and I did I start to push the weight in deadlifting. 
So I never really tried to get strong in the deadlift or really strong in squats. They were very sporadically put in my program. Even when I kind of knew that I should be doing it, mm -hmm. I still kind of fell prey to the, oh, it bothers my back and I'm not very good at it. It wasn't until later on, until like we met, which was about seven years ago when we first started talking, that I started to really start to push the weight and deadlifting and get, and then also address why it was bothering me. Like when I squatted, like I, I didn't really care about. Yeah, it's crazy because you turned yourself into a good squatter. You didn't just fix the issues. You're actually a really good squatter now, which is a huge change. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm a really good squatter. You're a really good squatter, dude. When you, when you, you know, before you really worked on mobility, you, you had squats cause problems for you. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was, I definitely was an awful squatter. I mean, I look back at the pictures of like how I was squatting and stuff mm -hmm. before and it looked, it looked painful. <laughs> um, and it's, it took a long time. It took a lot of work on working on the mobility. Um, and I, I would definitely say I've, I've made a ton of progress from where I was. But that's also what has now made me fall in love with those movements is I have put a tremendous amount of work in both those movements for the last seven years or so. And I still feel like there's so much more for me to get out of it because I'm constantly adjusting and tweaking and improving the mobility and the control. They, they, they're the exercises that keep giving. And it's yeah. uh, one of the biggest pr myths in resistance training in general um, is that, uh, that exercises are all uh, relatively equal. This one works your back. So does this one. Pretty much the same. Just pick your one you like or whatever. Not true. Exercises are not equal. Some just produce tremendous results while others, you know, take a lot longer to produce results. And I, I feel very, I'm, so for me, I feel very blessed because at a young age, you know, 16 years old, working out at the YMCA, seeing the big powerlifter guys using the one squat rack mm -hmm. and just watching them. And then they took me through a workout. They taught me how to squat. They taught me to deadlift. Back then I deadlifted sumo um, because that's the way that they taught me as a kid. And that was the summer before either junior year or sophomore. I think it was a junior year, right? And, and at this point, I'd already been lifting weights or working out for a couple of years. So I started as a young kid. That summer, I gained almost 15 pounds of muscle. It was like, I, I got stretch marks. Yeah. I blew up. My legs grew. My back grew. Went back to school and all the kids were like, oh man, you know, first time ever anybody ever said, I look like I worked out. And it was because I did those lifts. Well, you yeah. know, you guys are both like strength guys, right? You guys talk a lot about that. And I cared more about how I looked. And so I did so much of the bodybuilder isolation yeah. exercise for so long. What I think really sold me on forever after this, squatting and deadlifting being the, the foundation of my training, was that I realized I was doing way less and my body looked better than what it was yeah. when I was, I mean, I was a seven day a week hammer, tons of exercises, tons of volume in the gym, but I was doing the leg extensions, the leg, the leg press, the lateral raise machines and the shoulder press machines. And I was that guy, I was the bodybuilder guy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, and then all of a sudden I started to really focus on like the four big lifts and then no workout ever did not include at least one, if not all of them in the training. And I felt like that's all I had to do, and I had as good or a better physique than all this other shit. That's what sold me. Yeah. It's so funny. It's the irony of it is uh, I was completely focused on the strength aspect and just following coaches' orders and like going through the workouts with the team and just trying to produce as much strength as possible. Meanwhile, the first time I actually take my shirt off and I'm playing basketball, you know, I get a girl to compliment me on my chest and my my abs and all this stuff, and I'm like, what? what? Like I had no. No idea that uh, you know my body was transforming so much, and uh, and that actually is what led me into like bodybuilder style training. So then I started to actually yeah, be like, oh well, I can you know I can get compliments. It's cool. Yeah. When you're a when you're a teenage guy or a twenty in your twenties, and a girl gives you a compliment, you're gonna yeah. like like you ever have a girl? I remember I remember a girl complimented my cologne. What do you think I wore forever after that? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, still to this day. Yeah, a single girl said she liked the way I smell. Oh, this is the cologne I'm gonna wear now. It's still all my the time. cool water. I <laughs> exactly. since, like, I like high. your shirt. You know, mom, can you buy me 10 of these shirts? Because someone complimented me. Anyway, yeah. I was, uh, so I did some interesting reading yesterday. I wanted to uh, talk to you guys about so I, something I wasn't fully aware of. So, you know, how we had a call with uh, the the founders of Ned uh, the other day, right? And yeah. They, they were talking about, they have their, their yeah, brand new product. They have their new uh, product. Um, uh, I can't remember the name Mello. of it. Mellow. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And you, you, you know, it's good to relax the body, maybe before bed, all that stuff. And they talked about magnesium. And I'd heard, 
that magnesium deficiency was relatively common, but I wasn't really familiar with- Is it like 60%? Is that what it is? So uh, 75% of Americans probably don't meet the daily requirements for oh, magnesium. Wow. As much as a quarter of Americans probably meet the standards for a true magnesium deficiency. Now you, you ask why, why is that? A lot of it has to do with the fact that the soil, soil is, right, yeah, yeah, it's so depleted, right? So we, w the, w the way we, we use soil to grow things, we figured out that we could throw things in the soil to make it grow plants, but we don't do anything else to the soil. So it's still lacking lots of nutrients. So eating, you know, magnesium fruit, uh, excuse me, magnesium rich foods today versus, I don't know, 50 years ago, it's still going to have like 50% or more less magnesium than it did 50 years ago. It's just, we just don't have a lot of in it, uh, in, in our food anymore. Not only that, but if you, when you're under a lot of chronic stress, your body depletes magnesium and all that stuff. So, seventy almost almost two, uh, seventy five percent of all of us are probably not meeting our minimum requirements. Do you guys know what the the signs of magnesium deficiency are? No, terrible. so I'm going to pull them up because uh, I thought this was fascinating, and a lot of us like kind of mu muscle twitches and so things like that. Muscle twitches and cramps, which you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, this happens to me. Oh, you know, all, all the time. All the time. Like my eye will twitch or. I'll, you know, I'll get an exercise, the muscle will cramp a little bit. So that's one that's common. Um, the, all kinds of mental disorders uh, are a result from lack of magnesium, including uh, and especially anxiety. So mm. a lot of times people feel oh, anxious. Mm -hmm. Physical an uh, anxiety mm -hmm. can come from not having enough magnesium. Of course, bone issues, osteoporosis, magnesium is important for that. Um, you have fatigue and muscle weakness. So people who are tired can't figure out why they're so fatigued. Oftentimes, it could be just a lack of magnesium. High blood pressure is another one. Asthma. This is this one I didn't know, which is oh, wow. kind of interesting. Irregular heartbeat. That's another one that sometimes um, I'll get. So supplementing with magnesium uh, can make a big difference. The thing with magnesium, though, is uh, it's it, not all forms are very easily uh, absorbed, right? Yeah. So in the, uh, the the product that Ned has. They chose three forms of magnesium, one of which uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it's really good for relaxing, for you know, it, it, you know, anxiety, that kind of stuff. So really good stuff. Really now, interesting. When they do when they do studies like this, and they and they take things like soil, and then they say that it's deficient in in magnesium. Are we not also taking into account how many farmers those supplement with that? So like. I mean, my I, my experience is mostly with marijuana and tomatoes and things like that. But that's a that's a common supplement that you you actually have to put in a tea for the plants because it's not getting enough magnesium. So they're testing the food and the soil at, when they're ready to grow. Okay. So not before, right? But mm -hmm. even even when you supplement, it's still not the same because they'll put the minimum required to cause the plants uh, to grow. It's mm -hmm. not like it was uh, before. But nonetheless, at the end of the day. You know, again, and this is Healthline that I'm, you know, I'm well, reading these statistics from. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a, a good chunk of us are not getting enough magnesium, and, it, and it's subtle, right? So mm -hmm. you just say, like, oh, I don't feel so good. I'm kind of anxious, or you know, I feel kind of tired, or whatever. And magnesium, if you supplement with it, it you get the right form, um, can produce a pretty good effect. Yeah, I just remember hearing like with with farming and, and like rotating the crops in different like areas of the land, like was like the super crucial. Uh, and and I don't know if that was like a lost uh, thing with industrial farming or not, but like uh, somewhere along the lines, like we started to kind of you know lose a lot of the nutrients from the soil and, and keep reusing the same land over and over again yeah. without well, replenishing it. I I saw a thing one time that was like a you know they showed like a a potato or a tomato from like the 30s or something like that and they compared the nutrient value of mm. of it and it's like ridiculous i mean it's we're yeah. less than like half of what it was just like the topsoil like runs off and goes into the you know the rivers you, you and talked that. about this with dr bush right yeah yeah so they've we've also uh are basically spraying the ground with uh antibiotics uh, in, in yeah. essence when we spray them with uh, glyphosate so glyphosates are chemicals that kill weeds and then we modify plants to resist these particular sprays so we could spray a bunch of corn crops kills the weeds the corn survives but the glyphosates uh actually can uh, kill bacteria so we're actually killing lots of the natural bacteria the i've never well. heard someone say that like antibiotics is that is that something that is widely known now like i mean i feel like 
more and more pe- people are privy to antibiotics in our gut and how it's not yeah. an ideal thing, right? Just maybe, what, 10, 15 years ago, everybody was on that bandwagon, something goes wrong, take antibiotics, kill it oh, all Oh, yeah, off. when I was a kid, you go to the doctor, you, doctors throw antibiotics at right. anything. But I, yeah. feel like, I feel like the audience and, and the, the masses are, are, are privy to that. Now, are, is that widely known with what's going on with... Well, so so we I'm using the term antibiotics very, very loosely. So it's not, a, uh, it's not like an antibiotic where it just destroys all bacteria, but it does... Does interfere with a pathway that antibiotics need to, excuse me, that that bacteria need to survive. I think it's called the, I don't remember the name of it, Sycamati or something like that. It's a, it's a weird name, but it interferes with bacteria. And so it can start to kill the bacteria over time. And we're spraying, you know, the ground with like, mm. you know, millions and millions of gallons of the stuff all the time. Sounds like stigmati. So the so the so the ground is just becoming, you know, more and more sterile. And then on top of it, we breed, you know, plants to be higher, to be tastier. So they typically have more sugar, less nutrients, right? So, you know, if you look at like a like an apple today versus, you know, hundreds of years ago, apples back then were like full of seeds and fiber, right, yeah. not very much flesh. Now it's like a big sugar bomb yeah. apple and it's like this big or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, we're, we, we're, we're changing things to the point where supplementing. I used to think if you ate really well, then you probably don't you need to supplement. But I'm starting to realize that in some cases you might still need to supplement like mm-hmm. vitamin D uh, mm-hmm. or or magnesium, for example. It's just yeah. so common. Well, do you think that because we're continuing to do that and it seems like the soil is becoming more and more depleted over time that it's more, it's going to be more common that people are having to supplement totally. for a lot of these things? Totally. Oh, yeah, yeah, Absolutely. We'll have to for, we'll fortify food like we do with, uh, you know, like salt. You know, they put yeah. iodine in salt. You know, they so. fortify everything these days. Yeah, yeah. Before they put it in the market, yeah, I got so a fun fact for you guys. This is just like a real quick fun fact. What do you think is uh, the website? Or I, I know what your guys' answer is going to be, but uh, <laughs> what do you guys think the 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 website that you go to that you are most likely to get a virus from? A virus phone? Pornhub, of course. Yeah, so that's what I would think. Oh, like oh, like it's not porn sites. No, yeah, no, uh, religious sites. Oh my gosh, are can you, you believe that? Th- is that true? That's a fact. Yeah. No way! Fact check me. Now, yeah, is I, it, I was my mind was blown. Now, is it the religious sites themselves were created so that people could spread viruses, or because they're just not super secure, and so that might be a part of it? I okay. don't know. Like honestly, I don't know what the the inner workings are. You know, the the story wow, behind that, but that just blew my mind. I was like, wow. what? I always thought it was porn. Where did you read that? That's super it, interesting. Yeah, I was one of those like weird, you know, fun facts that that like a lot of people don't know. I would never guess that. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it makes sense if you think about it. Yeah. Like, what's your theory on that? Well, I mean, like the 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 established porn sites, probably it's like in their best interest to not because the, the stigma, right? The, the well, I mean, I would still bet Pornhub is number yeah. two. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it's up there. Yeah, because right? anytime I've, if I didn't, I tell you what, Apple is the only thing I could watch porn on. Because if I watch it on a fucking <laughs> on a on a PC, well, you're getting a, you're getting a virus, yeah. dude. Have it's, you ever talked to any IT guy? Like you're bringing your your laptop <laughs> yeah. in, and you're like, he fixes like, oh, you you had a porn problem. Yeah, you know? he never yeah, he never says, out on you. Yeah, he never says, were you searching yeah. church sites? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he never says that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't, I didn't know that. That's so random. Oh, yeah, that's strange. Right? So what's your theory on that? I don't know. I feel like maybe their sites just they don't spend a lot of money on. Security curing them or something i have no idea yeah, yeah but I mean, think it, the virus know. means that somebody is 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 actually taking the time to put bugs in that right in order yeah. to do that right? i don't so know if somebody's it's, bombing it with the yeah, yeah I don't malware think, or whatever yeah do you think i don't think it's the actual like people who made the site themselves yeah, I don't think unless so. they're like fake sites no 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 that'd be other people right yeah, isn't yeah, that yeah. what even does on the porn it's not like yeah. Pornhub is the one Dude, doing that yeah, that reminds like a cyber attack that, that reminds me when when doug and i made some of our first sites for was it maps anabolic that this happened doug yes so when we first created maps and it was before mind pump right we created a website and somebody hacked it and Mm -hmm. it was porn so you type in the whatever the site was i don't remember what it was maps and a block i don't remember what this program just got awesome yeah and (laughs) and you know how i found out i sent it to my aunt i'm like oh check out our new website and she's like did you mean to send this to me and i clicked on i'm like don't i text doug i'm like what the fuck don't you guys remember when we first started mind pump my my facebook page was bigger than anything else oh yeah and it got i had to just let it go remember and casey tried to figure it out he tried to get get it all off and we couldn't so i just let that page go yeah i could not that's right there's a there's a facebook page out there with your picture on it (laughs) yes not you yeah and it's Uh. all it is is like porn videos Uh. all all it is you (laughs) open it up and that's all it is on that entire we tried so hard to to hack back into it and to yeah. clean it all up 
and I just said F it, forget it. But at one, at one point, that was bigger than Instagram or anything else. So that I I had like a I don't know I want to say. 20, 40,000 followers, somewhere in that range on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I was doing Facebook first before I was doing Instagram. Yeah. And that was my main source of contacts. And then it got hacked and it was like, oh shit. So I'll never, never get that back. What a, cra you know, yeah. so many people build businesses now off of like one Instagram page or one Facebook page. Yeah. When it gets hacked, you're pretty much screwed, right? There's no who do you call? Yeah, what do you do? Like, you what can, do you do? You can, Didn't you can, this just happen to our our, our buddy? Uh, yeah, Wicked and, Sean? and he just got it back. I saw okay. he got it back. So you have to file with like Instagram or Facebook, and then tell them like, hey, somebody else has got control. Meanwhile, they could just destroy your audience in, the, in a short period of time. Yeah, well, and so what I noticed. So speaking of who you're talking about, Justin, I I've been watching to see like his and his engagement is like through the floor now because oh, in that man. small window that somebody had hacked him and they were trying to promote um <sighs> what was it they were promoting some they were sell they were some supplement or something you know they were selling um oh, was what? it like cryptocurrency stuff yes or? it was okay. like uh crypto mining that's right uh, yeah you know give us eight hundred dollars and we'll help you mine three thousand yeah, bitcoin or some yeah some shit <laughs> so they were using his page for like a week or so to do that and then now he's got it back but then i look at when he does a post and it's like terrible engagement so i'm sure he lost a majority of the people that were paying attention to oh, that sucks. and yeah. then i also don't know what the algorithm what happens to the instagram algorithm because that thing's all automated so maybe it picks up what they're doing and then now all of a sudden it kind of shadow bans him a little bit so yeah just it's it's crazy yeah if you especially if you're, you get that popular in one platform and then you get excited about that and you want to put like a lot more effort in just that direction but then you know you're at the whim of something like that happening and then now what do you do you well, don't have a backup already i, I don't know if it, it was us being being a bunch of old older wise guys or just dumb luck <laughs> just paranoid but i you know it was something that i think that we we were we were really cautious about when we built this like it was i remember that was part of the motivation of also doing all the other like remember when we first get going like having youtube channels having the podcast place having all our individual instagrams yeah. mm -hmm. just so we have a foot there yeah and just in case something happened to one of them that we weren't like married to that one channel as our outlet to get to people so i mean i'm glad we did because you know that i think the, the smartest thing to do is if you build your business off of one platform uh to somehow capture your audience in a way that's secure so emails uh you know something because if that goes down or if you get if they change the algorithm or you get shadow banned or you get hacked at least you can email your list and be like, hey this is what happened right you can come find well, otherwise you're screwed they can't find they don't know how to find you you can you have no way of getting in contact with them and your business is dead and even though emails can get hacked too they say that's one of the safest bets for you to do is to yeah. just get get on which remember at the beginning we didn't think that either we thought email was dead i know ironically email most valuable you know it is know. and to this day for the business of all the things that we do email is still the most valuable part of it it blows my mind ah uh, yeah. so crazy i yeah. wanted to uh I wanted to revisit a conversation that we were just having the other day. Um, uh, I told you guys, you had brought up the supplement, Sal. Oh, you mean the, the, the drug? The, the drug, yeah, the fat yeah, loss yeah, drug. Yeah. And I had told you that I remembered a post that just a couple of days before that I had seen the uh, Dr. Spencer Nadalski, I think is how you pronounce yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I know, and I said that you, got, we, you guys had gone back and forth. I think I've gone back and forth with him a few times because there's some things that he says that we don't agree with. There's a lot of stuff he does say that we do agree with. And I wanted you to read his post. Did you get a chance to read it? Yeah, so I have it in front of me. So he's talking about the drug. It's I don't know if I'm saying it right. It's uh, semaglutide. Um, and it is the first like really effective weight loss drug uh, that we've seen. I, 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 I talked about the statistics in a previous episode, but a significant portion of the people who took this drug lost weight. And the, the reason why they lost the weight is it it effectively controls appetite. So they just ate less is what ended up happening. Mm. Um, so he did a post about the drug and he's talking about how it was introduced as a type 2 diabetes treatment and it's been studied for obesity due to its powerful appetite suppressing effects. And then he says, you know, I know there are uh, many out there who feel these drugs are not needed because all people have to do is eat less. Of course, we need to eat fewer calories and we burn. However, there are many with obesity to where the appetite drivers are too strong when trying to lose weight. To combat this, we have medicines like this to help. They're a tool, just like anything else. And he says, also, many ask if they need to be used long term and if you stop, will you gain the weight back? The answer is usually yes. Think of obesity as a disease. We wouldn't stop blood pressure medicine just because some, someone has normal blood pressure after starting the medicine. The same with obesity. Of course, there are lifestyle behavioral changes which may occur while using the medicine which can combat the appetite drives, but many will have the continued appetite drive after, uh, after stopping. 
By the way, this medicine is now the most powerful one we have. So he's talking about that. And then at the end, he says, bottom line, if this new medicine makes you uneasy, you may have an anti-obesity bias. Uh, not a, I'm not a fan of that statement. That's, yeah, it's a very bold statement. There's a couple things here I have a, a, a problem with. Uh, obesity as a disease. Um, I don't know if I can, I, I don't, I, you know, I think we label everything a disease nowadays mm. because it, it, it encourages- it allows you to create a drug for it. Yes. If it's a disease, well, now we have a drug uh, that, can, yeah. that can solve it. Um, the other thing too, with drugs like this that blunt your appetite- We've talked about this. Actually, we did bring this up on when we talked about it. Yes, you'll eat less and you will lose weight as a result. But the reason why you were eating the way you did doesn't go away, right? So if you're 60 pounds overweight, well, I used to tell this to clients all the time. At some point, you were 15 pounds away, uh, overweight. At another point, you were 30 pounds overweight, 40 pounds, 50 pounds. And now you're at 60 pounds overweight. You ignore the signs because you're using food as a way to self-medicate for something, whether it's anxiety, depression, bored. Uh, maybe you're just uh, you just don't know how to deal with the feeling of cravings, whatever uh, that may be. Um, and if you don't solve that problem, it's still there. So now you, you your appetite's down, but you're still sad or bored or whatever, you tend to replace it with other things yeah. or you just don't become happy. I lost weight, but I'm still, you know, feel the same way I did before. Yeah. One of those. So he, he may also made another statement in there. It was like, you know, there may or may not be behavioral lifestyle changes that occur, uh, you know, uh, going through, you know, taking this drug and that to me is, it's almost like an afterthought, right? So mm. it's, it's not on the forefront of, you know, pursuit of like really addressing the behavior and the lifestyle, like leading into this. It's, it's here's, you know, here's the solution. And then, oh yeah, this might happen along the way, which would be great. But also you could just stay on this drug, which, you know, to me, like creates this dependency on something, uh, you know, exogenous to, to bring in instead of like really addressing. Yeah. Well, I would love to see how many people actually make behavioral changes while using a drug like this. Yeah, I would like to see that. I would like to, and you know they'll never do a study like that because it's not going to support the drug. Mm -hmm. It's not going to show, I, I mean, I can just guess and be probably pretty accurate that more than 80% of them are not going to change. It may even be higher than that. You're going to see people using the drug to get down to that, that weight, and that's going to be something they become dependent on the rest of their life because they never addressed. Because well, here, you guys remember training these clients. Mm -hmm. How many of them, like, you just told them, hey, there's a reason why we're here. What is it? And they were like, oh, this is the reason why. You know, mm -hmm. and, like, and I'm working on it, and I'm going to therapy for it. Like, that never happened. No, no. It rarely ever happened. It takes happened. a long time for them to divulge that. Yeah, and even get to that place. Or, or what they a lot of times think it's the weight that's making them feel so depressed and how many times have we talked about this on the show that you're never going to be happy if you don't address what makes you feel that way it's not the weight it's not mm -hmm. being 60 or that's 80. a symptom yes. yes and so you throwing drugs at this i'm just and i'm i'm, I'm, I'm with you sal i'm not a fan of the um ob uh, obesity thing being a disease I'm just I don't I don't subscribe to that, and I know why the uh, the medical community does. Obesity causes diseases. It's a sim, but it's a symptom of your actions. It's not something you catch. It's not a you know. It's it exaggerates. And you problems. can you can say this and be empathetic at the same time. Oh yeah. Because I, what I don't like is the defense right of oh you guys are shaming these people and uh, no, no that's ridiculous. Nah, get out of here no. with that. Anti obesity bullshit. bias is ridiculous. I, I've I've worked my entire career helping people with obesity. I care very deeply about helping people uh, mm -hmm. through that process. So mm -hmm. that's that's ridiculous. Look, I don't think we should take the drug off the market. Uh, but you know, here's what Western medicine does really well. It reminds me, I'll give you guys an example. I had a client that illustrated this so beautifully. She was uh, older. I think she was at the time in her late 70s. And I was going to start training her. And I, got, I wanted to get clearance from her doctor because she hadn't worked out ever. Um, and she had some, some health issues. And so whenever I get, have a situation like that, I like to work with the doctor personally. So I had the doctor send me a list of medications that she's on and tell me what she shouldn't do and all that stuff, right? I get this list of medications, okay? I'm not exaggerating. It was two pages long. Wow. I'm, you're talking about like 20 different medications. Now, here's the crazy part. Half of the medications 
counteract all the uh, uh, symptoms. They were they were, were to, to other other drugs. So yeah. Other drugs. If you take this drug, you have constipation. So you can take this drug to, to get, help you poop. To help yeah, you poop. Yeah, yeah. Half the drugs were there to fight the side effects, side effects of the too. other drug. Oh, this one makes me drowsy, so I'm taking this one to help me stay awake. This one makes me constipated, so I have to take this one to <laughs> yeah. you know help me poop. Uh, this one hurts my appetite. This one helps. It was insane. And so this is what Western medicine tends to do: is we're going to give you a drug on top of a drug on top of a drug. So what's the problem? The problem problem is we have uh, just totally distorted eating behaviors. We, we have bad relationships with food. Uh, we, we don't understand this at all. We're very inactive. Here's a drug to help with that. I guarantee the drug will cost something. They're going to have to give them something else. Hey, my depression is still here. I lost the 30 pounds, but I'm still depressed you, now. You, well, here's an antidepressant. Well, now I, I you know I, it's hard for me to get a boner because the antidepressant, oh, here's a, something to help you with your boner. Oh, well, you know, now you know it's just it keeps going. You know what it reminds me of like a, as far as a visual, like in cartoons when, they, when they're like at a dam and you see a crack and you see like one stream of water coming out and then they plug that one stream one of water. Starts. Now another one comes out, and then they're plugging that one, and then a bunch of them over Dude. here, and they're just constantly plugging holes when all they had to do was reinforce the dam. Well, yeah. and I want to make it clear too that we and we talked about this last time, but you know, if you were somebody who's in a life or death situation, of course, I'm all for things like this. If I've got a client who's at 400 pounds, and Doc says, "Listen, you've got a less than a year to live unless we address this, and we got to get this off." Here is this incredible drug that has lots of research behind it that shows that it's going to work, and this is going to help us get that first hundred pounds off, mm -hmm. and then we can start working on your behavioral stuff. I understand there, but what I know ends up happening in Western medicine is anybody that's capable to prescribe that to gets prescribed that, and we're going to have the same thing that we have with like people doing the state the stomach staple. It's mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if you are at this weight, you automatically qualify it. Forget the fact of trying to adjust the behavior stuff first and really getting to the root cause. Let's just throw a drug at it. Right it's away. that it's yep. that's the way it works. It's what's the symptom? Create a drug to solve the symptom. You know, oh, your head hurts. Here's medication to make your headache go away. But I'm not going to ask you why your head hurts. Who knows? You could be banging your head against the wall every morning, and I have no idea. But here's a painkiller mm -hmm. for your headache. Do you guys remember what was the first yeah. thing that we disagree with him that he was promoting? I do. Uh, no. Was it was it meal replacement? Sh yes, it was shakes. Yeah. It was the whole you know protein shakes. In instead of eating. Yeah, instead of eating. And I remember training clients like this. That's like, that never fucking oh, lasts. This you, is like a person that has a, you have a person that has a, a behavioral yeah. issues with eating, and you throw shakes at them for a while? Very common in weight loss clinics. I mean, that's... They, they treat a lot of these things. It's like, yeah, it, let's reduce the calories down to basically nothing, but it's managed yeah. by, you know, doctors and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, it's just like really aggressive intervention where, you know, like this stuff just takes a lot of time. Here, here, here's, the, here's what I'll say, and I'll make this statement, and I'll stand behind it. Uh, I will – you take the Western medicine medical community – and their track record against obesity is shit. They have a terrible track record against obesity. I'm talking about long term, not just getting them to lose the weight. That's easy. They'll, like you said, Adam. They'll here's your shakes. It's 1,200 calories. Yeah, you a day. can lipo suck yeah. out of them too. No, no, no. I'm talking about long term success. The Western medicine medical community terrible, terrible, terrible track record. Now let's take them and let's 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 have them compete against good trainers and good wellness coaches, and let's see who has a better track record. Right. Now, which one uses drugs? Which one uses all the latest? technology and medicines and which one uses behavior which one works with exercise and which one again has the better track record yeah. so if you have a weight loss issue if you have a weight problem if you're dealing with obesity and this is something that you've been challenged with for a long time who should you go to the doctor who fails almost every single time long term yeah. or you can go work with a coach who has tremendous success rates in comparison now I, again i'm not going to i'm not going to lie the success rates are not 90% in any category but they're far better and the, again the western medicine approach terrible and we're still dealing with it today obesity yeah. is still a big kill here's more evidence they had uh, what was that company that came out with that procedure where they attached a tube oh, yeah, uh, to yeah, your yeah. stomach this is a real – look this up. This is a real thing. Maybe Doug can find the name of it while I'm – Aspire Assist, I believe. Aspire, Aspire Assist. Assist. I still remember that, huh? Oh, yeah. Literally, this is a, a approved treatment for obesity, and this is what it is. It's like stomach bulimia. It is a tube attached to your stomach. After you eat, you go to the bathroom, and you empty the stomach out into the toilet. So rather than making yourself throw up, yeah. you open the tube up, if and this is approved. Yeah. Who makes that decision? And how can you sleep at night, dude? Uh, I don't know. Come dude. on. Yeah, that's crazy Are stuff. Are you serious? It's hey, I wanted to, I, uh, total terrible transition, but 
I brought up the the Maryland thing the other day, and, and then there's also oh, some, right. So Maryland, what was the deal with Maryland? They're going to do like a tax. Ten, on, yeah, they want to do like a ten percent tax on any sort of uh, um, digital advertising that goes through their state, oh, right? God. And now you have you also have South Dakota's in a battle right now with Google and Apple that don't want to give up thirty percent of their uh, app sales that are going on. So right now, if you have- So if you, if you build a business in, uh, where is it? South Dakota. Then you have to give them 30%? Well, your- that's everywhere. Oh, right okay. now, if we built an app right now and we put it out and we sell it for three ninety nine, and you mm. put it out on Apple or Google's platform, they cu- they get their 30% cut. Okay. That's just how it works. You use, and, and it's been like that for everybody. You're, you're starting to get states now that are starting to try and pass bills to push back on that and say okay. they don't want to give up their money. So, so uh, Apple can't get uh, the thirty percent. Is yes. that what that is? Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. I mean, and what now? I th- who gets it then? Are they saying they, they don't get it, so we can tax yeah, it later? Ah, uh, no, they get it. They the get. It. Yeah, they the get state. it. Oh. So I think that's. I think mm. what we're what we're seeing is happening is just a big pushback from all the states against. I, I mean, mm-hmm. we've seen like it's just a. I mean, here's the pendulum swinging back, right? Tech yeah. has gotten away with so much, and they got so much control, and they're influencing so much. Now you're starting to see some of these states push back, and here's an example how they can push. Yeah, back. I saw Florida too trying to you know create laws and, and legislate uh, for social media in terms of like uh, what kind of content they're putting out and like who how they're like you're going through that and making sure it's fact checked and all these types of things. The yeah. So first off, if it makes money, well if it, here we go. If it moves, if it breathes, if it walks, if it exists, they'll find a way to tax it. That's just the way government works. Yeah. If, if it makes money. At at some point, they're like, "How can we figure out a way to take some of this uh, this money?" So that's number one. Number two, uh, and we I, we all said this on the po- podcast: the era of uh, free, kind of open social media, it's over. Yeah. It's totally over. You, you, when you see both political parties go after them, when you see the accusations of them influencing elections and corruption, all this other stuff, you know what's going to follow because mm-hmm. what they're doing is they're drumming up public support. Yeah. What's going to follow are strong controls and regulations. So well, they're just giants now. Mm-hmm. Look how big these companies got. It's insane how big they are and how powerful they are. Of course that makes the government like shudder and they want to do something about yeah, it. Yeah, so it's like uh they're going they're going to fight against them apparently. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, Amazon just bought uh Sales, S E L Z, which is uh Spot or not Shopify's competitor too now. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's the thing too about these they're so massive. They can buy up these other companies that are just other gateways and just control more avenues of revenue that are coming through. Yeah, but you know, I, you know, the thing too is, I, I when we look at this, it's, and this happens with any big industry, um, you, we forget or we take for granted what they've provided, mm-hmm. and it just looks like a big company now that we we need to you know attack or whatever. Right. Look, tech has revolutionized uh, the economy. It's created well, we choose opportunities. To, we choose that, to use it. You that's know? right, yeah. and, and and it's created opportunities. That would have never existed. Uh, could you imagine the most jobs? Right and, and, and could you imagine a, a, a pandemic shutdowns without uh, DoorDash, Amazon? You know, without all the all these companies that were making life okay mm-hmm. while shutting you know stores down, telling you can't go anywhere. It would have been impossible, right? Yep. So, I mean, they've brought some some amazing things, but they're big, and so that makes them a target now. Speaking of that, yep. Insta, you know, you talk about the pandemic and the things that we wouldn't be able to survive with. Uh, Instacart is probably one of the things I use more than anything else, and they have an IPO in this quarter coming up. So oh, keep your eye wow. open for that one right there. That's going to be huge. I think so, too. Them, and then what was the other one, Coinbase? Yeah, Coinbase. Oh, that's oh. a good one. Yeah, Dude, yeah. I got some big news. Uh-oh. Uh, Magic Spoon's now available in Canada. Oh, yes! finally. I Dude, saw how that. many DMs have you gotten about it? Like, I've always- I feel like I, my heart breaks a little, you know, it's like, oh, you guys are missing out. Yeah. You know, all you connects. <laughs> yeah. So I think, and, and I, I believe that we're one of the, I think we're formally announcing it first because they didn't, they emailed their their audience that uh, that is from Canada, right? So they emailed, any email they had from Canada, email and let them know personally. But I don't think there's been a public announcement. So we yeah. have a ton of people in Canada that listen to the show yeah. that we've all been getting personal DMs going, when in the hell are you guys going to be able to carry I, both books? Butcher Box and Magic Spoon don't go up there. Well, Magic Spoon does now, so uh, they're going to crush. Yeah, oh, yeah. and I think well, they obviously are crushing. It's probably it's uh, they're they're, yeah, they're word is spreading. Their growth is exploding right now with their product. I am. I, they I, made it into the fitness influencers too. Now you know that when we, which I know people try and throw us in that category. I absolutely hate that category. Yeah, I, I hate being influencer. called an influencer. <laughs> but Ew, I, dirty I, word. I, I, yeah, I think of like Instagram influencer kids that are, but they've now made their way into them. I see them all over now. All these other big accounts that are. 
fitness influencers that are all now chomping down the the magic spoon. So oh well, I another mean, cool brand that I know that we brought in. Well, the space. talk about yeah, like a, a a great way to like hit your macros and eat like good you know delicious cereal. Like yeah. of course yeah. it's gonna explode. Yeah. You yeah, know with yeah, all that. Yeah, who doesn't like that? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Hey, I read a cool study on how to appear honest when you're when you're talking. What? Yeah. So they did this study. I'm gonna pull it up. You need uh, something to quick. tell you how to do that. That's yeah. already a red and flag. And then uh, you were supposed to add appear yeah. when you're lying. Is that what it is? Or is it like <laughs> no, no. So is this like those authenticity masterminds? Yeah. Well, so so there's a couple things. So when you and you, if you study politics and you watch debates um, and you study who is more effective, it's always the person that speaks and sounds more confident that wins the debate, even though they could be lying yeah. the entire time. Well, this is what made Obama of so course. famous. Yeah, right? I mean, well, one of the best speakers well, of all he's time. Very stately and yeah, polished. Yeah, calm and whatever. And, and if you can talk with confidence, um, it, even though you're full of shit. Oftentimes, people watching will just they'll believe you over the other person. Well, also, when someone asks you a question, if you pause before you reply, even if it's just for a few seconds, your answer is perceived to be less sincere and credible than ha if you had replied immediately. Oh. So if someone asks you, if you're ever trying to get away with a lie, I guess, someone asks you a question, answer. Like, right away. Like right away. Yeah. It's just top of mind. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. so funny because I'm trying to train myself <laughs> to be the opposite. I'm so quick to just respond, right? Yeah. What, what my, what's going through my head, which I've over time I've learned. That's when shit flies out that probably shouldn't fly yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm in a place now where I'm like, pause. Yeah. You know, just because you think you have the answer right away, Adam, or you yeah. have something you want to say, pause. It's okay. Long pauses are okay. So that's really funny that. It is because it's good. That's a good practice. It's a good practice to wait and measure your words and say what you mean, yeah. especially now that everything's recorded yeah, nowadays. You're, you're a lot more likely to get an honest answer that way, which is hilarious that that's recommended to me because it's like, well, also the telltale sign, somebody like lying, right? They're going to kind of pause, like look up, you know, to the side of, you know, Is that eyes. true? I've heard yeah, that. Yeah. No, no, yeah, they look up to neuro the linguistics. Side. Have you ever read a, a neuro-linguistic book? No. That's, yeah, they talk about it's up and to the left, Justin. Yeah, up and to that the left. That means exactly. I'm lying Yeah. if I look up to the left. Uh -huh. So if I look up to the right, I'm telling the it's truth. Cause you're yeah, yeah I've, I've, and I've tested this, and it's, it's definitely one of those things. It, it's, it's held. It's because the it's the side of your brain that's logical, right? So you have the logical and the creative side, and that's why it does. The eyes roll to the side that's the creative side. Mm -hmm. Because you're trying Just close to close your eyes. Because you're trying to come up with <laughs> a trying to come up with a new answer. Yeah, a story. Yeah. You're trying yeah. to make a story up in your head to give you an answer versus the logical side. So if it rolls to one side, you're trying to think of something and like come up wow. with it versus just Did I ever answer. tell you the time when I I thought I had a front desk sta staff member and I thought that that they, they did something they weren't supposed to and I brought them in my office with my operations manager and I set up before I asked them this whole like conversation. But I must have made them so nervous. So I sat there and I said, you know, uh, I really respect you. How do you like working here? Oh, I love it. Salus is a great place. You know, we do develop a lot of trust in our team. This is what this team is built on. So I did this whole talk and they're sitting there sweating. And then I asked them, is there anything that you want to tell me? You, you need to tell me. And I was expecting them to say, I don't remember what it was, but it was something silly like, yeah, I let people, you know, my friends work out for free or whatever. And this person sat there and just... They were selling babysitting for cash in the in the kids club. <laughs> they were stealing protein bars, and I'm sitting there trying to pretend like I already knew all the stuff. I'm yeah. Oh, I'm glad you're telling me. Thank you very much for. I'm sitting there like holy shit. <laughs> Whoa. This is this is all coming out. What's going on here? Wow, I remember. I remember the operations manager's like, man, you're like an interior. How did you get them? Down? Like, I didn't had no idea. I was like, you really out. broke them in there. Yeah, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> First question is from Mr. Kennedy. Can you talk about the different deadlift variations, traditional sumo, touch and go, Romanian deadlift, and the benefits of each? Should you vary them up? Should you vary them up? Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. It's not like you're going to say some more them stuff. Yeah. Should um, they vary them up? You know, one of the, sometimes one of the challenges with exercises is that if they have a similar name oh, or I'm they have the same name. This, I'm glad you're going this way. Yeah, you, you end up thinking that they're all interchangeable. So like so, front squat, Bulgarian split stance squat, back squat. You think, oh, they're all squats. So I'll just pick one and do that one. The truth is they're all different exercises Same very thing with the very different too. yeah it's yeah. not even i mean so i mean some are like similar but very very different yeah and with deadlifts it's, it's even worse because the powerlifting community which is the the one strength sport that really emphasizes deadlifts more than any other strength sport right because it's in their competition they allow you to to deadlift conventional or sumo doesn't matter those both count the same when you're doing your deadlift. And so people have, you know, they've assumed that they're 
kind of interchangeable. The reality is they're all different exercises. Now, some of them are more similar than the others, but they're all different, right? A sumo deadlift and a traditional uh, conventional deadlift, although both count in powerlifting, they are different on the body. They work the body totally different. Just because you're good at one doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good at the other one. And then they can get very different, like a Romanian deadlift or a stiff-legged deadlift. Very different from a conventional deadlift and a sumo deadlift. Um, so should you vary them? Absolutely. I think you totally should. I think it's a good idea to get good at one, and then once you get real good at it, you can transfer and move to another one. It's okay to have your favorite. Um, you know, My favorite is conventional. It's the way I love to deadlift. But I'll throw in sumo and trap bar deadlifts all the time, and I'll go through runs of training those to get really good at those. Um, Romanian deadlifts, that's a leg workout. You know that, that one I do in my leg workout. I don't do it in my back workout like I do conventional. Well, and I think that something that we say ad nauseum on this show is that you, the one that's going to benefit you the most is the one that you do the least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who's like uh, you, if you deadlift consistently, but you always do conventional, Sumo deadlifting for a while is going to be great. Great for strength gains, great for body composition, mm -hmm. great for fat burning. I mean, that is where you should go. If you train a certain way all the time, then mixing up. The only time it makes sense to do the same one all the time for me is if I'm training an actual competitor. Yeah, they have to get good at that one. Yeah, version. like if I have so, yeah. and that doesn't mean I'll, I'll never intermittently still use uh, mm -hmm. use the opposite. So if I have a someone who pulls sumo and that's what they they pull at their competition, we are going to pull sumo ninety percent of the time, maybe ninety five percent of the time. Still we'll do some other other way forms of deadlifting intermittently in there, but we want to be good at that movement because that's what they're going to go perform in. Everybody else, though, if you're just trying to get strong or you want to be you know healthy and fit or you want to change the way your body looks. The best thing you could possibly do is actually rotate through these. And yeah. how do you rotate through those? Uh, you know, there's there's no like one rule on how you have to do it. I personally like to keep one of those for sure always in my routine, if not one or two of those. And I'll stick to that for at least four to eight weeks before I rotate another one in. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's exactly the way I yeah, do it. Yeah, and I think too, like there's, there's uh, you know, if I'm going uh, for um, – Different, um, what do they call it? adaptations. So, uh, if if I'm going for something where I'm more power focused, I'm more speed focused. For instance, I'm going to be more likely to do like a touch and go, and that's something that fits within my programming. And so, I'll look at you know the options of what types of exercise will fit best within the actual program itself, or if I want to move in different directions, or you know really expose my body to different types of stimulus and movement. And I'll do something like if I never do sumo, then I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to rotate that in the programming. But I, I want to look at this as like like these are all different types of tools that fit great within, you know, this sort of pursuit that I have. So I'm glad you brought up touch and go because I would say touch and go is my least favorite of all of these. That's that are, the one you need to have the most control and best skill. And, 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 it, and it also makes the most sense, I would say, in only situation that Justin just mentioned. Like mm. you're really trying to work on the, the speed of a movement versus yes. the strength of that movement or getting good at that movement. Because touch and go, there's so much more room for air in that than just a standard pull a rep, gather yourself, pull a rep, gather yourself, yeah, the, pull the a rep. The point is the intent matters. Yes. So yes. you have to like evaluate that. Yeah, and the, the problem with touch and go is not that you're continuously deadlifting, because that's okay. You can do that with any exercise. Here's the problem. You have a long bar in your hands, and you're doing, I don't know, 10 reps, let's say, on one of those reps, the left side touches the floor before the right and one, just, even if it's a split second. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just a split Yeah, and it second. shifts you to the right or left, and if you have a lot of weight, that can yeah. cause problems. So your technique needs to be really, like really good, sound. And, and you need to be real stable. Like I'll never do touch, touch and go with super, super heavy weight. I've done it in the past, um, right. haphazardly. Not a good idea. Yeah, and not to mention the, the benefits that you get from it from just doing a, a conventional way of deadlifting where you actually have a little bit of rest in between, right, where you go and pull. Mm -hmm. You're not getting that much more benefit by doing the touch and go. Yeah. So for me, it, it really had – the client has to be – there, they have to already be advanced enough where they they've been lit. like if I was training one of you two, maybe we'll throw it in there. And even then, I just still don't see a tremendous amount of value in touch and go yeah. uh, deadlifts. So I, I there's I'm trying to think right now who I've trained where we have programmed that in. Most clients, I, I'm having them you, you know gather I, themselves. Uh, I, you know, if you uh, bodybuilders might benefit from touch and go, not going real heavy and focusing on the continual tension of the back and squeezing the lats, that might work. Here's another thing about deadlifts: because of the influence of powerlifting, we uh, a lot of people deadlift with an alternate grip, uh, one hand mm. forward, one hand back, and mm -hmm. that's because you can hold on to more weight. So I get that. 
do this. If you do that, make sure you switch hands in between every other set, right? Do just as much work with your left hand supinated yeah. as you do with your right hand supinated. I fell into this trap for years. I deadlifted and I was better with the right supinated than the left, so that's what I stuck with. And I developed an imbalance in my back that probably still to this day yeah. I have a little bit. It took me a long it time. It's an unnecessary torsion it, it, in the back. Right. So either alternate them back and forth or use a hook grip. That's what I do now. I use a hook grip and now both hands are pronated. Next question is from Brian Pata. I understand the importance of rest time between sets, but what about rest time between movements? Sometimes it takes a little longer than I'd like to get from the squat rack to an op open bench in a crowded gym. Does this throw off programming or anything else? No. It doesn't throw off your programming. I mean, it's different, right? If you're moving, you know, if you're resting one minute in between sets and then you change exercises and you keep that one minute, uh, that's going to be a different workout than if you go one minute between sets and then between exercises, it's five minutes because of setup or whatever. Um, to be quite honest with you, I prefer to have a longer rest period between exercises. Yeah. I'll keep the rest between sets faster, but between exercises, especially if it's different, you know, body part, you know, like he said, squat to bench. I'm going to, I'm going to wait a little bit, five, six, seven minutes before I go into my bench I always rest. lean on quality of reps and, and performance of the reps. And so, yeah, there's sometimes where you do get fatigued and you do need a little bit more rest uh, between, you know, jumping right back in and doing the same movement. And I think that the reason why I picked this question is because this comes up a lot with the, the determined amount of time and the allotted time that's programmed in there. And you mm. got to listen to your body and you got to pay attention to the signs and signals of like how you're breathing, you know, like, mm -hmm. what, like how fatigued you feel. Like it, you got to pay attention to all these things uh, and determine that for yourself. But also this is sort of like a guideline uh, that, you know, you, you can kind of shoot and aspire to. But really, at the end of the day, this is going to be determined specifically on the individual we're, we're also talking about something that is a, a splitting hair difference here totally so if you had so if they did a study and uh, of course i'm just speculating here but i feel pretty confident that if you did a study where somebody rested like sal said five to seven minutes between the exercises versus one the difference after you know six months of them training that way the, the, would be very very little mm -hmm. one of them would probably be more cardiovascular adapted because there's such low rest periods the other one wouldn't the strength difference in the two of them i don't know maybe you would see more of a strength difference in the person that actually gave them some rest i wouldn't i don't think i would see much of a difference i don't think this is one of those things that i'd have one of my clients worry too much about yeah, yeah it's not that big of a deal and you know what i'll say this even for some people um i'll this is a good this is fun try this out right because i know some people are so concerned with keeping the pace and I got to get the sweat or whatever. If you have the time to do this, give this a shot. I, I guarantee it'll be one of your favorite workouts ever. Your hour workout, give yourself two hours. Take your time. Yeah. Go slow, practice the form, uh, lift a little heavier, uh, take breaks in liberating. between sets. Give, give yourself like a two-hour window to do a one-hour workout and spread it out, and I guarantee it'll become one of the best workouts I've ever I had. I actually will never forget the day that happened to me. So <clears throat> I was training with my buddy, and this is the time I'm, I've talked on the show before. I don't like lifting partners. I had a lifting partner at the time. This was one of the reasons why I didn't like it. He loved to talk to everybody. We're in the gym one day, and we must have ran into five or six and he stops to talk every single time which draws me in we end up being at the gym for like two and a half hours i leave the gym going like that was a terrible workout yeah i didn't really get a solid pump i really didn't feel anything the next day i was sore as shit and didn't realize i just had never trained that way mm -hmm. and because i had such long rest periods i wasn't used to my body feeling that way in a workout and you're probably lifting heavier as a result and that's what ended up happening mm -hmm. and so after that i thought man anytime i have an opportunity when i don't have a time frame i might stretch this thing out to 90 to two hours why not i don't get to do it a lot because a lot of times i'm on a time crunch but if i do have the opportunity i'm gonna do that and there's tremendous benefit yeah, and you can that. have fun with it like uh right now i'm doing a split where i work upper body and lower body so I'll go upper body lower body and then i'll rest and then upper lower and you know kind of like that right so when i'm doing upper body if i start with uh typically i'll start with chest or back and I'll do two exercises per body part. But rather than doing the two exercises for chest and then going and then doing the two exercises for back, you guys have seen me do this. I'll do a set for chest, then I'll do a set for back. Then I'll do a set for chest, then I'll do a set for back. And I'll mix it up that way, and it's a totally different stimulus. It's not superior, it's just different. And I get my body to, to respond again. Next question is from Mr. Dave O.C., what does the behind the scenes of creating a MAPS program look like? For instance, 
How long is the writing process, common stumbling blocks, trials on multiple people, etc.? Which program was the hardest to create? The, this this is probably mm. some of my fondest memories of, I agree. of yeah. Mind Pump. Nostalgia. Is, is creating uh, programs. Now, the first program was Maps Anabolic. I created that one. Every single one after that, we all wrote together, and we developed this, this process, which is really interesting. It started with the next program we created, which is Maps Performance where we would rent a house and it usually had to be like an hour or two away. And this became like, in hindsight, we started saying, oh, this is the way we, we do it. But we'd, we'd have a house one or two hours away and we'd drive to the house and in the drive, we'd have this great debate and conversation about mm -hmm. what the program should look like, things that we need to look out for. Doug would be in the back and he'd have a, a pen and paper. And I, Doug, have you saved these books with notes and stuff? Everyone. Like yeah. Oh, that's and, cool. Oh, awesome. I can't. We got to look at these at some point, right? Yeah. And it's just, he's just scribbling in the back, right? And I'm yelling and Adam's yelling and Justin's, you know, piping up and we're just having a blast. At some point, a joint comes out and we'll smoke a little <laughs> weed. And then the creativity really gets crazy. Uh, then we get to the house. And what we do is we sit and we write this program for. Usually it's about a day of creating and writing the whole workout program. And it goes through a couple iterations before we're, we're, we're satisfied with the workout that we've written. But that's kind of the process. Well, and the, and the, and to address the part about trials on multiple people, that's all the years of experience for yes. each of us individually. Yeah. What was gr What's great is that we're all uh, very different. I mean, we train ourselves different. We've had different experiences with clients, yet all of us have trained tons and tons of people. So when we decide what an adaptation is that we're going to go after, so for example, like you're talking about performance. So, And a lot of times we would head up not even certain on what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. We just know, hey, it's time for us to create a program. The Part of the conversation is what is our audience looking for? What do we think is the next progression from what we've written before? Yeah. So there's a lot of that. And then all of a sudden it, like, we figure out, okay, this is the direction we're going to go. This is the avatar, the client we're thinking of that we want to build this for. And I remember performance was really, at that time, of the podcast was early on, we were really hammering CrossFit. Yeah, that was an answer to that. Way. We were yeah. really hammering CrossFit, and you know, the and the pushback we got was what people felt. Oh, I've just my mobility feels so good, and it's such great functional training, and I love the challenging work. And so, this is what we were hearing from our audience: we're like, okay, we want to address this. Yeah. If we had a client who wanted that type of an adaptation that you get from CrossFit training, but we were all anti the programming of of CrossFit, how would we design a program? MAPS Performance was really an answer to mm -hmm. that. That's how that program was decided. Then the exercise order and what what we, what we days and all that stuff is like, that's the day of like arguing. You know, yeah. we have, well, we all have our different backgrounds and strengths and like, uh, you know, what we've applied to, you know, our, our different clientele. And, uh, you know, and that's one of those things you see it in the programs. You see how, you know, each one of us consider very specific things that, you know, are sort of, uh, you, you know, non-negotiables for us. And, and, and two, this is what makes for the, you know, the, the quality of the programs go up because there's more considerations that need to be had for your average person. And so that's where we have a lot of the debate and discussion. Well, well, I had athletes, you know, that would do this and I'd warm them up this way and I'd have them do these type of mobility, you know, exercises. Then we discuss that. And then, uh, well, I used this and I saw, you you know, a physical therapist uses this, and I thought that was brilliant. And then, you know, we all have this sort of discussion, which then, you know, narrows it down to what's going to be the most effective uh, introduction to that type of pursuit. Yeah, and, and, it's, yeah. a, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of talking, standing on tables, <laughs> demonstrating exercises, arguing. Useless graphs. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we would get stuck on like a, like me. we'd get stuck on a, on a phase or something and it would just, it would be like four hour, a four hour debate yeah. and discussion. We'd have to take a break and we'd come back and then Doug would write it all out and we'd look at it on the, on the table and, oh wait, this doesn't make sense. This has to fall. It's a lot of fun. As far as the most challenging to create, yeah. it's a hands down maps prime. Hands yeah. down. Well, yeah, most difficult, but most rewarding. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And here's why it was so challenging. So, you know, we all trainers with lots and lots of experience, right? So we all train people for two decades or more. And we wanted to create a program where people could assess themselves and then determine the best priming movements that they did before they worked out for their body. Now, here's the challenge. It's extremely individual. So when you're writing a program for people to work out, you, you know, it's fine if you write general workout programs that will work with most people. But when you're talking about an assessment and specifically training or priming your body for an exercise, 
That's very, it's very different from person to person. Yeah. Now we knew assessments because it's what we deal with clients, but I'm like, I can't, how could we possibly teach the average person or fitness fanatic how to assess themselves? This is like a whole class by itself. Like you know, there's posture and movement assessments. And if the body moves this way, you look at this and that. It was just so complicated. And we literally, I, I don't remember, I think it took us a full day and a half of just figuring that part out. We were like so stuck. Yeah. Yeah. And then it hit us to create a, a, a compass where you had three movements. Mm -hmm. Based off those movements, if you couldn't complete the task, then it pointed in the direction right. of, of certain it exercises. sort of a flow chart. It, that, that's it. And then that all came together. I remember we, Doug has the video. We put uh, we had the papers that we wrote on and we put them up on the window. Mm -hmm. Remember? Yeah. That's and then we, we sat there and explained it and it was just- That's was, when we were up at the Atlantis, right? That's when we did that one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we were up at the Atlantis and you had those big windows and we had all this stuff all taped up on the window. Those, and you know, and then after that, there's a lot, even when we decide, okay, this is the program, there's a lot of like minor changes along the way, right? Yes. As we start to- shoot and film and we start to see it in place and, and then go through it. We're going like, okay, I like yeah. how this feels. Let's change. We were this too look. creative with this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, prime prime was like, so the thing I remember prime, well, you know, it's cool too. I'd look, talking about this is kind of, you know, fun going down memory lane here. You know, what's interesting is, uh, you know, Sal, obviously he wrote anabolic all alone. So that's obviously his baby. Performance, I really feel like, is Justin's baby. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, even though it was all of us together, it really, I think, uh, pulled out a lot of his strengths uh, that he had. And then aesthetic, I really feel, was my baby because I was right in the heart of competing totally. mm -hmm. and building a physique was all what was in my mind at that time. And so it's kind of neat. And then Prime is really the culmination of all three of yeah, us. Yeah, that's a good way. And totally. and when you think about it, we in in a perfect world, we would have wrote Maps Prime first. Because of that, but we we also have a business, right? We had to make money. We had to get this thing going to where we could support the team that we have and everything. And so we were forced to go the direction of, okay, we have to give somebody something they can go apply and go in the gym right away. But we all knew damn well that Prime is where everybody should start because it's exactly how you started every single client. I don't care what your goal was. If you hired me day one and probably day one through like, you know, day 14 mm -hmm. even, it's all assessing stuff. It's yeah. really figuring out that client so that you can really customize a program that that's curtailed to them. Mm -hmm. And that's why Prime really should have been first. And, and you know, here's another part mm -hmm. too. Is when we wanted to create programs that, you know, were not in our realm of expertise. I mean, first off, we could create programs, uh, I feel confident, for anybody, right? But are there realms where it would be better or more, give us be more more integrity to involve somebody who's got direct expertise in that field? And so this is what we did with a lot of our programs. Like Map Strong, we got Robert Oberst to go with us. Mm -hmm. We're going to create this program with an actual strongman competitor and see what happens. You know, OCR was Amelia Boone. You know, she competes in OCR. She's a she's a champion. We did power lift with uh, Pollock, who's mm -hmm. a powerlifting competitor. And we were able to take them in, go through the, and, and really, that was really fun, writing a workout program with people who competed and were advanced in those particular areas. That was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, for Dr. Me. Brink for Prime yeah. Pro. Dr. Brink Dr. for Prime Brink. Pro, mm -hmm. right, right. So yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, for me, it was some of the best memories. I, sure. I do. I miss that part of the business. It was a, a fun time because the company was really just starting and really starting to grow. And there was a lot of, and back then, like that was a lifeline for us to create another program. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was that part of like, we had to do this. We had to create it. It was a lot of investment to start. It's expensive to build it. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people may not realize, I mean, you know, it's a digital program that you get. You must think it's really basic, but I mean, every time we write one of those, it's anywhere between 30 and $50,000 in investment on us from everything from the models to the back end support. To it to the videographer to the editing of all yep. of it so it's a it's a and then also the the trip to build it and do it and the time frame to get it all done so yeah definitely a major process to put it out this is also why we felt okay with charging a rate that was significantly higher than average if we, we did our homework too it's not like we just randomly came across across this price point where we're at when you look at digital programs that are sold online the average price point is 27 to 57 dollars and, you know, and we we had the audacity to go ask for 130 plus for a lot of our program, but we also knew mm -hmm. what we put into it and what they were going to get. And how effective they yeah. were. Right. These are ones that actually, it's not just a workout. This it's one's not something you find in a magazine. Right. Yeah. It's way more. Next question is from John Falbert. I hear a lot about how bad red meat is for your health, but you guys often talk about eating it almost daily. Are there any actual issues with eating too much red meat? 
Okay, so uh, I'll answer the second part, right? Are there issues with eating too much red meat? Well, uh, you can eat probably too much of anything, mm -hmm. and it can cause a problem. That being said, is red meat uh, bad for your health? Is it is it one of those foods that you should put in a category of, you know, unhealthy? No, it's one of the healthiest things uh, that you can eat. And I'm not talking about processed red meat. So I'm not talking about sausage or salami or, you know, foods that, you know, lunch meats and that kind of stuff. I'm talking about like steak, you know, uh, maybe ground beef. Are those uh, unhealthy? Absolutely not. They're some of the most nutrient dense foods you'll find anywhere. Um, and they provide a very good source of protein. The fat in red meat, this is where they get the, the, the bad rap, right? Oh, they're high in saturated fat or they're high in whatever. We now know that uh, if you're otherwise healthy, those things really don't have uh, a negative effect uh, on the body. Um, and if you get a source like grass-fed red meat, the fatty acid profile actually is pretty damn balanced. For athletic performance and strength, I can't think of a single food that is probably more beneficial for uh, for strength and for athletic performance. In fact, if I've actually had people just switch their meat, their source of protein to red meat and seen their strength go up because of it. Yeah. No, I, I think I probably eat red meat on the daily. I think it's a, it's a staple. It's also a staple in most clients, unless I had a client that had a, a, a spe special condition or mm -hmm. absolutely hated kind of outlier. Right. Absolutely hated red meat, then maybe it wouldn't be in there. But for most people, and that's it's so funny about the the stuff that comes out to say that the, the negative things about red meat, it's all in, these are the in context of people that are are eating an absurd amount of calories over, and then we're, we're we're cherry picking data that's around the red meat. And if you have somebody in a in a calorie controlled environment, or you're writing a diet for them that they're following, and they're training and exercising, red meat's like one of the best things that should be in well, their diet. It's, it's uh, the ir irony is a lot of times you end up having to get your client to supplement, you know, for a lot of those those nutrients and things that you know they would have got otherwise from red meat, like iron, or you know, even if their protein levels are are a bit lower than they normally. Uh, you know, would be if they're including it a bit more regularly in their diet. So uh, it, to me, it's just like the body recognizes it. You know, this is something that it, it is very efficient at utilizing if, unless you have a special condition or your, you know, your, your body actually rejects red meat. Yeah. And, you know, here's the other problem too, is because we've now had decades of misinformation demonizing red meat as an unhealthy food, when you do these uh, these observational studies, and most nutrition studies are garbage because they're based off of surveys and asking people questions. And I'm going to tell you something right now as a personal trainer. Uh, people almost, they never accurately uh, know what their calories are. They never accurately know what their macros are. People are terrible at reporting uh, their diets. And so but, so, but that's most nutritional studies. So if you have decades of information telling you that red meat is unhealthy, what kind of people, because of that, will then eat more red meat or at least not taking out of their diet? People who are not health conscious. So now you've got this bias, right? Oh, look, these people over here eat more red meat and they're also more unhealthy. Well, yeah, because for years we've been told that red meat is unhealthy. So now the only people that eat a lot of red meat are people that don't really think about their health. And the people who eat lots of chicken or fish are people who read all this information, but they also exercise. They also don't overeat. You know, the people who eat red meat also eat lots of burgers. Uh, they eat lots of fries. They process foods. They don't exercise a lot. So it's very, very difficult to, to, to break it out. But the best studies that we have that control certain things show that red meat is is a health food. It's actually a health food. It's good for you. Um, those again, those other studies put people in a category because of other behaviors. And the more we push this myth that red meat is bad for you, the more we'll start to see that. Because again, if, if you eat a lot of red meat today, you're probably somebody that doesn't care about your health because all the information you've been reading, uh, or maybe well, you didn't read about your health. Every unfortunately, you have to consider the source. You have to follow the money. You have to. All these things have to be a consideration, uh, especially any information these days. You have to actually do, uh, you know, your due diligence and find out, you know, where this information is actually coming from because there are things within the diet specifically uh, that have been proven that there's been, uh, you know, shenanigans within the studies and things. And it, I mean, look at 
at the look at the uh, pyramid, look at the nutrition pyramid and things that we've been taught as kids that are like, uh, you know, healthy for us. And mm -hmm. it's just you have to be able to be open to, uh, you, you know, like thinking that your your ideas might be wrong. Yeah, well, well, here's a good example. OK, if you went back into the 80s and maybe early 90s, I have butter, and, right, I was going to say, and you studied people's uh, butter and margarine consumption, here's what you would have found. People who ate butter were not as healthy as people who ate margarine. This is back in the 80s and 90s. Now, why is that? Because back then, butter was hammered as unhealthy and margarine was hammered as being healthy. So the people who were health conscious, who also exercised, who also watched their calories, who also paid attention to that kind of stuff, ate margarine. The people who didn't pay attention to being healthy, they ate butter like they always did. So now you've got this correlation, butter unhealthy, margarine healthy. Now we know for a fact the uh, it's reversed. Butter is good for you. Margarine was terrible. Margarine was these partially hydrogenated you know, oils, these trans fats that are pretty much bad for you at almost any dose. We know now that butter is, uh, is is good. There's nothing wrong with butter, and it was margarine that was bad. But if you had looked at those studies then, yep. it would have looked like the opposite. This is what's happened with a lot of these, uh, when you read these nutritional studies on uh, red meat. But when they do the controls, again, red meat is a health food. It's one of the most nutrient-dense foods uh, that you'll find. Can you eat too much of it? Yeah, you can eat too much of anything. So, of course, on the other end of the scale is uh, if you overeat anything, you can cause yourself Which, by the problems. way, that, that's, a that's a lot of that. Like, to yeah. eat, just overeat red meat. But, in, uh, you know, Justin, you've done the carnivore diet. Yeah. It's hard to overeat <laughs> yeah. red meat on a diet that's purely all red meat. Yeah, I mean, yeah. your, your body, get, you get so satiated from eating red meat. Where it's not ideal is if, you, if a lot of your red meat comes from McDonald's and Burger King yeah. with the fries and the milkshake on top of that. That's where all of a sudden now red meat looks oh. bad. Absolutely. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio come find us on youtube mind pump podcast you can also find all of us on social media instagram is the place to look you can find justin at mind pump justin you can find me at mind pump sal and adam at mind pump adam this is the part of, of happiness that people don't usually understand true happiness requires unhappiness why because purpose requires pain to find meaning in your life or and there's and you know pain is is just incredibly sacred if we miss out on pain, we miss out on post-traumatic growth, we miss out on experiences, we miss out on 